Well, welcome. I want to let you know that I'm coming uh, to you from the Church of the Good Shepherd in Winona Lake, Indiana. And it's such a joy to be with you today. Uh, this is a very, very historic uh, church. Um, there's a lot of ties uh, to the Church of the Good Shepherd with Billy Sunday. Some of you might know of him. If you don't, you can Google Billy Sunday and, and some different things come up. He was a former professional baseball player and he found Christ and it became a well-known evangelist back in his day, the turn of the last century up until the 1930s. And it was kind of the Billy Graham of his day. There's also some ties in this church to Billy Graham. Uh, the building next door, uh, the Westminster, it used to be the Westminster Hotel, and there were some all-night prayer vigils uh, before Billy Graham's famous Los Angeles revival and crusade in the late 40s. And some of those uh, all-night prayer vigils were held in this building. There's some wonderful ties to Homer Rotaheber as well. So uh, it's just a joy to be here today, and I welcome all of you from the Church of the Good Shepherd, and I, I trust this will warm your heart today. You know, I'd like to have a word of prayer, and then I'd like to share some things with you about the incredible resurrection story. Here on this Palm Sunday, I'd like us to think about this amazing resurrection story. So would you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for all of your blessings. Thank you for caring for us. Lord, thank you for uh, your uh, guiding in our lives. And thank you, Lord, for uh, just how you, uh, through your word, teach us and guide us and encourage us and help us. And thank you for that. In your wonderful and precious name we pray. Amen. This is Palm Sunday, and that is the Sunday that traditionally when Jesus came into Jerusalem. You know, I was looking at Matthew 21, and just to say a few words about this, where Jesus uh, rode into town on a on a donkey, and uh, and a, a small donkey, Matthew 21, it talks about this, but you know, that was actually predicted. Jesus coming into Jerusalem was predicted in Zechariah 9.9, and so a, a prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus doing that, and the people were, you know, they were waving the the palm branches, this a triumphal entry, it's, it's often symbolic of, you know, when kings, when conquering kings would come in, in that time period of history, and as they wave and they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, you know, save us, or save us now, or salvation has come, and these ideas that are captured in, in the shouting out of Hosanna. And so, during this entire week, and I, I think I sent you before online some different resources to, to study the week of the Passion, as many have called it. Uh, Christians and believers of various traditions have observed uh, the week of the Passion in different ways and uh, things to remember and things that are celebrated, milestones along the way. But today, what I wanted to do in thinking of Palm Sunday, I wanted to take a resurrection message and break it into two parts. I think it'll take uh, more time on video than I would like to do it all in one part. So I thought I would break this down a little bit. I want to read from Matthew 28. If you have a Bible, you can get that. Uh, just follow along as I read here. Matthew uh, chapter 28 and uh, beginning at verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the week, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the t see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where he lay. Here is the history of the world's greatest religions. Just a, a, a short summary. Egypt and their gods, you realize that they're all gone. They're ineffective, of no use for people today. What about mighty Rome and the Roman Empire and their gods? Well, the same as Egypt and only memories exist. It's history now. What about Buddha 
Well, he died, and after 200 years of oral tradition, his teachings were put into writings, but he was not the central character of his teachings. Islam, founded by Muhammad, but he is dead now too. He actually died as a result of being poisoned. Can anyone tell me today how Christianity or true Christianity is different? What makes this day so special to us? As we think about next week, what is so significant about the resurrection? Could it be that our founder, our Lord, our master is truly and indeed risen? That Jesus rose from the dead some 2,000 years ago and he is alive? Or is this just some fanciful Sunday school story? Is this just uh, some written and oral tradition that we share with our children and grandchildren? Is this just some wonderful made-up thing so that uh, preachers can have a job? You know, a lot of people think those things. A lot of people are very skeptical of the resurrection. I want you to really stop and think about this incredible event known as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You need to not only listen with your heart, but with your mind today. You know, it's good to to be like the disciple Peter in John chapter 20 and verse 5. John chapter 20 is another passage of Scripture that talks about uh, Jesus' resurrection. And it tells us in John chapter 20 that Peter came, and it says that Peter was gazing or stooping down, looking intently, bent over, peeping into, looking in and gazing to see if Jesus was there, if he was still in the grave. But I have news for you. Peter, along with the women, found the tomb empty. So let me start with this, and this will be our, our topic for today. This will give you something to study this week as you prepare for the resurrection. First of all, the resurrection of Christ is an incredible fact. Yes, let me say that again. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is an incredible fact, not fiction. I don't know if you've seen the movie about Lee Strobel and about his life. Lee Strobel was a pastor at Willow Creek for a number of years. He was a Chicago newspaper writer years before that, and he was a skeptic. And the, the book he wrote, first of all, was The Case for Christ, and then there was a movie back in 2017 that was done. I would encourage you this week, if you've not seen that, to watch it. This was a skeptic. This was a highly educated, intelligent man. Lee Strobel today, and for many years, has believed this also as a fact. This is a fact. The tomb is empty. There is no one there. There's no one home. There is no body. It is empty. So fact number one, Jesus was seen by people in deep sorrow or mourning who were not expecting to see a risen Lord. Think about this. Think about the women, how emotional they were. They were not expecting a risen Lord. I don't know about you, but when I go to a funeral home to visit to see a family member or a friend, I'm not expecting to see them alive. I have emotionally, psychologically, uh, mentally, you know, even spiritually prepared myself for, for the reality. Yet, these women go to anoint the body and bring spices. This was the custom of Jesus' day. Just like we sometimes bring flowers or order flowers or take flowers to the grave. There's no trickery on their part. There's no deception or an elaborate plot to fake the resurrection. They are simply going to mourn Jesus, who they believe is truly dead. Deep sorrow does not and cannot Effect. You cannot fake deep sorrow. John chapter 20 and verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. She was weeping. This is an expression for deep sorrow. That she was very upset at this moment. Does this sound like people that didn't believe that Jesus was dead? Or that they were planning to do some type of a plot? You say, well... Again, you're reading from the New Testament. My friend, there's probably no other document in all of history 
that is more historically reliable than the New Testament. In fact, many of you would uh, think highly of the writings of Plato. You would think highly of the writings like the Iliad and the Odyssey, and you would say that, yes, those are historically accurate. Do you realize that the documents to support the New Testament far outweigh any documents of antiquities? I had heard at one time in my past studies that there were over 24,000 manuscripts to support the authenticity of the New Testament. So I believe we can make a solid case that everything we're reading is authentic. I also believe that since it is authentic, we have to consider the words and the statements that are being made. These individuals who were historic figures actually said and did these things. Jesus actually said and did the things that he said that he was going to do. So, just by way of review, uh, I want to go back and mention this fact one. Jesus was seen by people in deep sorrow or mourning who were not expecting to see a risen Lord. Fact number two, Jesus was seen by all the women, the disciples, and two men on the road to Emmaus. We're not going to read the passage today, but at home you could put me on pause and go read Luke chapter 24. Think about this. He was seen by the women, the disciples, and two men on the road to Emmaus. In John chapter 20, he was seen by Peter and John. Keep in mind, remember, these were practical men, fishermen. These were not guys that were given to fanciful stories and easily being duped. You know, Luke chapter 24, on the road to Emmaus, I've often thought I would love to have been on that road, and I would love to have heard the teachings of Jesus. It says that in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 15, and, and then again in verse 27 and 31, that he was teaching them things. Their, their hearts burned within them. They had never heard anyone teach like this before. So there were witnesses. Fact number three, Jesus was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses of whom many were still alive when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15. If you take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it is a passage devoted to the resurrection. And Paul is using that passage to teach that Jesus genuinely and authentically rose bodily from the grave and he uses that to talk about future resurrections. The fact is that he starts the passage out by talking about that Jesus was seen by over 500 witnesses. So think about this. 500 witnesses, many were still alive. In other words, Paul said that, hey, you could actually go find them and talk to them. They saw him. Two men on the road to Emmaus, the disciples, the women. Paul could interview them and others could also. Listen, in court today with with one solid witness and with, along with physical and circumstantial evidence, if those things all line up, there's a good chance that a man or a woman can be convicted of a crime with one good witness. Yet we have over 500, the disciples, the women, the men on the road to Emmaus. False theories cannot hold up. There's the swoon theory, the revived theory, the plot theory, you can study these theories and look into them. And on the surface for intellectuals, and many people tell me that intellectually, they have great difficulty with the resurrection. That I want to believe, but I just intellectually struggle. Well, I'm going to tell you, my friends, no disrespect intended at all. I love you and the Lord loves you. But the swoon theory, the revive theory, and the plot theory hold up to nothing intellectual. It takes more faith to believe those because they are illogical and they go against what people who crucified individuals often knew. Roman soldiers knew when someone was dead. We have so many things mentioned in the New Testament, just like the spear in the side and the, and the blood uh, coming out, and the water coming out with it. He, he was dead. Jesus was no longer breathing. And for things to suggest that somehow the cool air of the tomb and, and the, uh, the dampness and somehow Jesus was revived. The plot theory is just an incredible theory. That somehow there was this 
great plot by those who follow Jesus. It was orchestrated to make it look like he rose from the dead. All I can tell you is please go and study these. There's a lot of good writings on them by Josh McDowell, Norman Geisler, uh, John Montgomery, uh, just to name a few. It is incredible to think that people come up with such theories. Ultimately, I think they're theories that people come up with so they can reject the resurrection. Think about Lee Strobel and some things that he has taught on this topic. There are many intellectuals. There are theological giants that have come to understand. At my own seminary, several of those uh, men were around uh, who did some incredible work. John Whitcomb, John Davis, Homer Kent, others who looked into these things in detail to see if they were true. I would encourage you to do the same thing. So Jesus was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses. Fact number four, the disciples of Jesus died for their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. Not only that, before they died, they were beaten, they were harassed, they were tortured, they were stoned. Let me ask you a question. Do men lie? Do men die for a lie? You say, that's easy for you to say. Let me try it again. Do men die for a lie? Men and women will die for a lot of things, right? They'll die for their family. They'll die for extended family. They, they might die for a community that they love very much. They might die for something they deeply, deeply believe in. A lot of things people will die for. But under torture, under duress, people will not die for a lie. The fact is that all of these men died or were tortured or were harassed. Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you want to look at a, an interesting book sometime, read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Tell me, would people die for a lie? I don't think so. I think intellectually, if you'll be honest, you know that as well. So think about these, these facts. The disciples of Jesus died for their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses, many of whom were still alive when Paul wrote that. Jesus was seen by all the women, the disciples, and two men on the road to Emmaus. Jesus was seen by people coming to his tomb who were in deep sorrow and mourning, and they were not expecting to see a risen Lord. Listen to what Josh McDowell, the international author and speaker, and a one-time skeptic of Christ's resurrection had to say. He said, for centuries, many of the world's distinguished philosophers have assumed Christianity as being irrational, superstitious, and absurd. Many have chosen simply to ignore the central issue of the resurrection. Others have tried to explain it away through various theories, but the historical evidence just can't be discounted. After more than 700 hours of studying this subject, I have come to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is either one of the most wicked, vicious, heartless hoaxes ever foisted on the minds of human beings, or it is the most remarkable fact of history. A student at the University of Uruguay said to me, Professor McDowell, why can't you refute Christianity? For a very simple reason, I answered. I am not able to explain away an event in history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When I was confronted with the overwhelming evidence for Christ's resurrection, I had to ask the logical question, what difference does all this evidence make to me? What difference does it make whether I believe or I do not believe that Christ rose again and died on the cross for my sins? The answer is put best by something Jesus said to a man who doubted. Thomas, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, John 14, 6. On the basis of all the evidence for Christ's resurrection and considering the fact that Jesus offers forgiveness of sin and an eternal relationship with God, who would be so foolhardy as to reject him? Christ is alive. He is living today. We know from Scripture that Jesus is with the Father. My friends, it's very hard if you're going to be intellectually honest, if you're just going to be truthful with yourself, to deny the historic fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
you know, that should help you. That should foister within you uh, an intellectual questioning of if Christ rose from the dead, then does that mean that the things that he said are then true? Some have offered to say that he is either a liar a or a lunatic, or he told the truth. You know, the fact is, there's nothing that would verify that Jesus was a liar. In fact, he was truthful to the end and even put him to death by being truthful. A lunatic? I don't think so. He argued in some of the most logical ways possible theologically with some of the greatest theological minds of his day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and some other schools of theology that were around in that time. The fact is that it's very, very hard to make a case that Jesus was a lunatic or a liar. That only leaves one option, that who he said he was is who he was and who he is. You know, we make religion very complicated, but it's not. In fact, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, guess what? That God has raised him from the dead you will be saved. You don't have to continue to live a life apart from God. You don't have to be in doubt. You don't have to keep uh, questioning back and forth. Study, I encourage, if you don't believe these things, study, search it. I think you're going to come to the same conclusion that some very smart and very knowledgeable people have come to, that Jesus is who he said he was. You know, on this Palm Sunday I hope this will encourage you as you think about Jesus entering into the town, as you think about Jesus uh, proclaiming truth. I want to encourage you to consider, is Jesus who he said he was? I think the answer is clearly yes. So it begs the question, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do? I trust that your answer will be, I will confess him as my Savior. If you have already and you're a believer, wonderful. Take this message and share it with others. Let other people know about this incredible Savior. When we get together next time, we're going to see how Jesus' resurrection is a blessing, and it's also a wonderful opportunity. And we'll talk about that more on Easter Sunday. Well, God bless you all. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for listening to me today. I pray that this will encourage you, and I hope it has in some way. But even if it hasn't, it's raised questions in your mind. And I trust that you will see Jesus as, as the person he said he was and come to believe your, yourself in this incredible resurrection story. It's really changed my life. I'm not the person today that I was years ago. That's because I've accepted this resurrected Jesus. Will you? God bless. Have a great day.